out of your mind into the body from theory to inspiration. So to say a little bit about where I come from in, in sort of my background thinking coming here into this conference on AR and VR, uh, I'm really enthusiastic about this kind of stuff. Um, so this is an experience where you're dropped from a plane and then you are in a parachute and birds are flying across your face and so on. Really cool. Um, I'm a little bit slightly more worried about this kind of uh, situation um, in which uh, two girls that I photographed are no longer looking at the Eiffel Tower. They traveled all around the world to get there and now they're looking at little screens with the Eiffel Tower on the background, mainly looking at themselves. Um, I'm, slight, I'm not totally negative about it, but I'm slightly worried about it. Um, I'm also very interested in this kind of situation where um, if you have something like Skype, Skypey, which has been designed for businessmen to exchange uh, factual information and, and have, have talks with each other, right? Um, here was a situation in which a little boy was actually playing hide and seek with another friend long distance, and their two mothers were running behind them with the, with the iPad and, the, and so on. Um, they could actually do it, they could play hide and seek, but there were some limits, of course, and you already see that the technology was not really designed for that kind of uh, social embodied engagement. Um, also, when they uh, tr started handing each other toys, it's where it really sort of broke down. Um, I'm also interested in this kinds of um, commercials. This is commercial 19, uh, 2012 for Google Glass, where you see a father swirling around his kid and then uh, being able to videotape that. So, is that the next step from the iPad example that I just showed? Is that going to be the way in which digital possibilities and online possibilities are going to merge into our everyday lives and be, really be meaningful? Or is this actually making things worse, sort of taking us out of a really good, meaningful moment with our child, only thinking about, oh, this is a nice photo opportunity, I'm going to put this on, in on Instagram and so on. So those are the things that I am thinking about, um, not to be uh, in any way. So if I'm critical, I'm critical in a sort of constructive sense, always trying to think about, so how can we build it? How can we make it in such a way that it does work, that it does add meaning to our everyday lives? Um, and what I very often get back to is a quote that you probably know if you're in this field uh, by Weiser who was the founder of ubiquitous computing, he was actually quite critical of VR at the time, a long time ago, uh, 1993. He said, VR is pulling us from the real world into the virtual one, whereas what he wanted to do is to get digital information back into the physical world. Because humans are of and in the everyday world. So my talk today is about um, how, what does it mean to say that we are of and in the everyday world? And I think what's really crucial for that is that we have a critical look at the body and the role of the body in how we experience things around us. And then the next question is, how could you add technology to that in such a way that you don't break things, but you sort of add to them? So, um, VR and AR are usually seen as embodied technologies, right? And especially if you compare them to graphical user interfaces, the classical ones on your screen, it's a whole different experience, right? And it's much more embodied, so to sp speak, in an intuitive or superficial sense. However, when you look more deeply into it, um, it might actually be quite problematic in the, in the way that Weiser said in the previous quote. And so I've Actually, I've been working much more on, uh, not on virtual reality at all, a little bit on augmented reality, but mostly on designing physical things that are also interactive. So smart objects, uh, physical spaces, tangibles, um, Internet of Things kind of constellations in your environment, in your physical world, right? So from that, I think, and using 
all kinds of embodied theories and philosophies that I've sort of drawn into this design world. I think I have some ideas about what it means to be embodied in the world and why that's important for our experience and how we generate meaning. And I hope today to show, to, to sort of present that back to you and, and together think about how could we make that use, how, how could we make that useful for VR and AR as well. So these are some of the things that I've been doing uh, on, uh, mainly right now, I'm interested in designing uh, interactive um, technologies that help people with cognitive disabilities in their everyday lives. So um, that help people manage activities or uh, manage their emotions and so on. Uh, in different ways, using wearables or physical lights, ambient lights in the, in the room or um, uh, a floor that's an older project about a creative space in which there was a sort of interactive floor and you could sort of generate and share your ideas. So this is just to give a very short example. I don't have time to go into all, all my projects. Because we really need to do some philosophy right now. Um, we need to think back a little where do our conceptions, our assumptions, and our ideas about VR and AR come from? Well, traditionally, we picture ourselves a mind. So that's us, right? We have minds. And then there's digital information, a digital system. And then the problem for many designers seems to be to make an interface between the two, right? Human-computer interaction. And traditionally, the computer looked at this uh, question-answer kind of machine, and you had to wait until the next day for, before the answer came. Uh, later on, it looked like this. Uh, later on, it looked like this. Still there. And then at some point, we're now here, right? And if you see it in that line, VR is still a way of connecting a mind to a digital system. But it's a much more immersive and interactive and continuous and rich way of doing it, but it's still the same thing, right? But there's this line here, and below that line are things that we usually do not consider very well in design. One is the body, the physical body, and the other is sort of the space in which our bodies are physically situated, right? My feet are here on the ground. I put on the goggles this morning, and immediately I started becoming a little bit afraid, right? Of, uh, can, I, can I walk here? Can I, can I go there? Will I bump into things? I saw some nice uh, attempts, and they work quite well and for pragmatic reasons, like making a, making a square, making a space oh, that you already see. Oh, I, I can't go further than this, and so on and so forth. I also saw lots of designers and uh, owners of the, of the demos walking around people, <laughs> making sure that they don't bump into things. So we need to think more about this. Um, behind that is actually um, one person that has done us a lot of, uh, it's created a lot of problems for us. It's René Descartes, and he was the one that started uh, thinking about the mind as something really separate from the body. So the way I picture it now with mind and body is actually already a conception, right? that we have a mind and that it's separated from a physical body is not something that's uh, necessarily true. It's an idea. It's a theory. And this theory has been designed by René Descartes. He said, the only thing I can sure, be, be sure of is my own thinking, right? All the rest of it could be an illusion. Um, the only thing I know for sure is that I'm thinking, I'm experiencing this, this solution, so my mind is the only thing I can be really sure of. Now, my research has been on trying to sort of get away, do away with Descartes, and try to find out what if we, if we sort of simply ignore this split, if we say there is no split, there's some space in between, some, some alternative space in which there is no difference between mind and body between digital information or physical world. What's in there? Well, mostly drawing on embodied cognition theories and phenomenology, which is a very interesting stream of thought that, that very much applies to your field. Um, I say that the embodied experience that you have when you're in interaction with the world is like it's a, a tight coupling 
of what your brain is doing, but also what your body is doing, and the th stuff that's out there in the world itself. So the world is part of what makes for our experience. And let's see. So there's three main aspects in this. Uh, one is that we are utterly social beings. We are always already enmeshed in a social environment, and I'm not going to say anything about that today. The other one is that we are skilled beings, which relates very strongly to this idea of sensory motor contingencies uh, that we talked about this morning. And the other one is that we are embedded in a live world of artifacts and things and objects and spaces that sort of guide us in our activities. And I'm going to talk about these skills and the life world a little bit, because I think it's most applicable. So, connecting to VR, my question will be, um, is it possible to make true action-perception couplings in VR? Well, we might look at uh, Merleau-Ponty, who's a French philosopher, and he said, um, if you consider a person a blind man with his cane, the blind man um, sort of makes contact with the world through the cane, right? The, the cane is a technology, and this technology, it's, a, it's not a digital technology, it's just a physical artifact, but this, di this uh, physical technology helps the person, the blind person, to sort of perceive and act in the world. And this goes with continuous action and perception cycles, up to the point that the cane is simply no longer there. If you would ask a person who's blind and who's ready to, uh, readily using this cane, there is no cane. There's only, the cane is, as it were, an extension of the person's body, and you're feeling the world through the cane. Or you could say, where does the body end for a blind person? It ends at the tip of the cane and not at his hand. So that's what you would like to achieve using digital technologies as well, right? Like VR and AR. Well, if you want to do that, you have to think more about these action-perception couplings. So Mel Slater this morning already talked about it. Like he said, I don't remember what he said exactly. He said, if I want to see something there, I have to move my, my body like this, right? I would go one step further and say, if I want to go there, I have to look at certain things in order not to bump into them. So I want to turn it around. It's action first. The idea of affordances is that you are already busy in action doing something, and you need the perception in order to act correctly. But we tend to think, coming back to Descartes, we tend to think that thinking is the most important thing, then his perception is about how, the world, how you perceive the world, that comes first, and only after that we can talk about action, right? So the classical model is always first to perceive the world and then to act in it. Whereas the embodied view would say, no, first there's action, we're already acting, and then perception follows from that. And you see that in VR, right? There's a very strong experience you get when, when you move and the visual flow changes with your movement. And there's a, if the coupling is right, that is the most strong experience that you have in VR, right? That's always what you want to achieve, to have these nice couplings. Now, if people are engaged in these couplings for a long time, they develop skills. I'm sorry to say these white guys are Germans and they're losing. Um, <laughs> sorry. But um, the idea is that if you are involved in these action perception couplings over time, you get into a sort of, you get a skilled way of looking at the world, but this also means that the world shows up for you differently. So if you're a beginner in skiing, if you look at this hill, you don't see very much. You see, well, snow. Right? Or vacation, or people skiing. That's about what you see. It's a picture. But if you're an experienced skier, you see, ah, you see where, you, where, you, where, you, where you will go, right? You see opportunities for, for, you see, oh, dangerous area on the left, or you have to, uh, you already see yourself, you already feel yourself. Actually, the snow looks as, it looks movingly, or so. I don't know how to say it, but how many of you can ski? You guys know what I mean, right? I hope, at least. So, in some way, that's what you would like to achieve in this virtual experience, but it's very difficult because you have no physical feedback. Now, somebody sent me this picture of this sort of new suit where you have lots of inputs and you actually feel 
if you do an action in the VR world, you feel it physically on your body. And I think, at this moment, I think this is the only way to go. You really need physical tactile feedback, but you need to design it right. In the, in the newspaper article around this picture, it said something like, oh, now you can have, um, now you can feel a lizard creeping up on your back using these sensors. Well, that's all very nice and well, but that's not what I mean. That's just another perceptual input. That's just another experience. What you need to use these, these sensors for, these, these, these feedback uh, actuators for, what you need to use them for is that if you take an action, you immediately feel the, the coupling of what, the result of what you're doing. So it's about creating these couplings, not, creating about, the, not about creating the picture to perceive. Second, I have five more minutes, or what? Okay, keep going, he says. Keep going. All right, I'll keep going. Um, so, the second, so the first one was about VR and about creating these action perception couplings. The second topic that I want to briefly address is the idea of creating traces in the world, and I think augmented reality is actually quite promising for that. So this means that if we are, if you consider our everyday world, it's not a desert, it's not a jungle, at least for most of us here. Uh, it's a, actually a quite structured environment, right? If I want to know where to get out, um, I don't have to think about it. I just choose one of these paths, and I'm likely to be ending up somewhere outside of the building. I might even go to the station without much thinking, because everything around us is already structured, right? Now, we also structure this world ourselves. If we do something, like we work on a desk, what we do changes things. We physically put things here or there, and slowly the environment sort of comes to reflect what we're doing. So if we go away and we return the next day, um, we might immediately see what, to, what we were doing and what we have to do next, because these traces of what we're doing are still there. Now, you have this on very, all kinds of different levels, like on the, on the microsecond and minute level, but also on days level or weeks level. There's all kinds of traces building up, and they, they sort of construct our life world. Can we augment that with digital technology, right? By projecting things on it so that you can see traces that you would normally not see. I think that's a very promising idea. But what I want to uh, point out to is that it's very different from these sort of augmented reality concepts where um, Basically, what you create are just interface elements to a digital computer, but now, in this case, floating in the air, right? This example is from The Sixth Sense, right, from MIT. You might have seen the, movie, the TED Talk and, the, and the, the movie. Quite a radical breakthrough years ago. Uh, but uh, pictures like this made me laugh a little. Like, what, what am I going to do with buttons on my hand? Uh, it's no use at all, right? There's no, this is a utterly senseless use case, and one of the reasons behind this being a senseless use case is that it's, it doesn't really think about what objects in our environment actually do for us in thinking. We don't need operators or control buttons to send requests for a computer in our environment. We need, um, we need to be able to build up a life world. Right, which goes through these traces. So we need to think more about augmented reality as a tool to, for people to create their own structure over and over. It's a, it's a circle kind of thing. Like that, just like the sensory motor couplings, I'm always thinking in circles rather than in input-output as a linear thing. To give one example that I find in some way quite troublesome, I'm now very much involved in designing for people with autism. Now, there's a classical, quite caric caricature story that people with autism cannot recognize emotions. Uh, actually, there's lots of critique on that theory. But there's, of course, people building augmented reality to, which recognizes your emotions for, of other people and then presents the result to you in the corner of your screen in your Google Glass. So it says, oh, this person is, is happy, right? Does that really help? I very much doubt it. Why? Because it means for an autistic person to have yet another source of information that he has to deal with. 
and he has still to implement this linguistic information, saying happy, to thinking like, what do I need to do with this knowledge, right? Do I now need to also smile or whatever? It would be much more interesting to try and think about how could we have this online social, like this mimicry that Mel talked about this morning, about how you were sort of mimicking and copying and how your bodily position is responding to the bodily position of another, could we use technology to help people do that? That's much more interesting than this. All right, so I might, might have been a little bit critical. This is an old comic that uh, my father had uh, up, pinned up his wall in the 1980s, sort of a doom for future vision of uh, a world that we don't want to uh, live in. I'm, I'm not so pessimistic at all. I'm, I'm quite optimistic, and I think that technologies like AR and VR can really add meaning to our lives. But I do see two main challenges, and for VR, I see the challenge, how do we get beyond this sort of just presenting a very fancy, rich, visual scene, which still makes me very passive in looking at it, and really moving into this um, uh, situation in which I'm already acting. I also have, really have the ability to act. I can really feel and experience the result of what I'm doing and making it into a, a loop of action and perception. And for augmented reality, I do see great, great promises in using it to, for people to build up a live world of traces that makes the world even more easy for them. Maybe even personalized, right? I would see structure in this room that's really useful for me, but you wouldn't seeing it, so you would be bothered with it and so on. Lots of possibilities for AR, but we need to move beyond using AR to sort of present a, a 3D interface panel with which I can activate icons and buttons, right? So those are the two challenges that I see, and um, I hope to have given you a little bit of thought, and thanks for listening. <laughs>